Good morning, my fellow yogic travelers. I am mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope that you are too. And so before we begin our third day of tales from the Jewish sector of Dharma, I want to remind you that every day I am reaching out to you and looking to bring your inner child out to play. Balancing being so serious and significant significant in your life and what you do to being more light and allowing yourself to tap into those other wonderful free energies which aren't going anywhere. They're intrinsically important just because of the activity itself, not because you take it anywhere or collect anything from it. So first, in advance... Uh, I always suggest that you give thanks for the privilege of having the opportunity to do this, the karma that we have, that we can take time to practice and listen to these teachings. Uh, so in advance of any inspiration or teaching or healing or peace that you may get, any harmony, spiritual growth that happens as, as a result of this, already to say thank you, as Meister Eckhart says, if the only prayer you said is thank you, that would, that would suffice. And of course, what goes along with that is to let go, especially when it comes to forgiveness. Forgive everybody without expectation or reservation and mean it. Ask for forgiveness for yourself from other people who maybe you have done dirty. Uh, maybe you were a perpetrator in a former incarnation. And forgive yourself for mistakes you've made. And again, accept it and mean it. And if you do that, then you've got to enter into another realm of metaphor and symbol where we say just because the scriptures aren't true doesn't mean they're not true. And since we tend to literalize scriptures, that's why I like mythology, because when you have mythology, you know already from the outset, like in a fairy tale, once upon a time, you know it's not true. You're not looking for a one-to-one -one correspondence. So the mythological teachings and the stories that we, we talk about they're completely false on the outside, but totally true on the inside. It's an artful arrangement of lies that tells the truth. Or as another philosopher says, myths never were, but always are. So with that in mind, to cultivate body, mind, heart, spirit together, this is all about telling your truth. You know, there's a great little side story about Rabbi Elimelech, who when he went to the heavenly tribunal after his death, they said to him, so did you study as much as you could? I didn't do that. Well, did you pray as much as you were capable of? I didn't do that either. All right, well, did you do good mitzvahs? Did you act in kindness as much as possible to both Jew and non-Jew? I didn't do that either. Well, because you told the truth, you still have a portion in the world to come. Pretty merciful, right? So just acknowledge where you're not and do the best you can. Anyway, the name of this story, this um, <clears throat> tale is called The Storyteller or The Storytelling Yid. Uh, once upon a time, the Baal Shem Tov, the master of the good name, the founder of the Hasidic tradition, who came to uplift the downtrodden Jews who couldn't afford to send their children to school to maintain the culture, but he said, if you don't perform the mitzvahs with simcha, with joy, you only get the outer kernel, the guf, the body of the teaching. But if you do whatever you do with joy, then you get the, the, the neshama, the soul of the teaching. Anyway, uh, toward the end of his life, he gathered all his disciples together. And just like Jesus sending them out two by two, he assigned different tasks for each one. And to one little yid, Yankala, he said, you're going to be the storyteller. You're going to go all around and tell my stories. You know tons of them. You've been with me for 25 years, and then that's your path. And at first, he was like a little unnerved. He said, what? He's not going to teach me some kind of Kabbalistic meditation or some kind of special um, way of looking into the scriptures, and maybe the angel of the Torah will come to me and explain, and I'll get a revelation. No, instead, he wants to be a rancantur, a rancantur, a rancantur, a storyteller, an entertainer. But if the holy rabbi says, this is what I'm supposed to do, who am I to question? 
So I asked the rabbi, so when will I know my task is done? He says, don't worry, the day will come and you will know. So with that in his mind, off he went, he left his family, and for years he was traveling on the road, different cities, different countries, telling as many stories as he knew. After 25 years, he knew a ton. And I don't know how he made his way to Italy, where there were very few Jews and very few Hasidic Jews. But anyway, he somehow heard that there was an Italian nobleman who lived in Siena, who was offering 50 lira for every story about the Baal Shem Tov that he heard. And it, it perked up. He says, of course, the holy rabbi knew that if I was on the road long enough, I would hear about this guy. And because I know tons of stories, this is the way I'm going to make myself rich. And then I'll be able to retire and just study Torah the rest of my life. Oh, holy rabbi, Hegel rabbi, why did I, I doubt you at any point? And so off he went to Siena. And he went to the man's house, and he introduced himself, and the, the, the look of wild-eyed joy on this man's face was unbelievable. He says, this is fantastic. Listen, we'll wait until Friday night Shabbos. We'll invite all the Jews who are here, and then you can tell your stories. This is wonderful. So time came for the first story on Friday evening, and everybody was gathered around, and all of a sudden he went completely mind-numb, completely blank, couldn't remember a single story. Not a word came from his mouth. Very, very embarrassing. He tried to apologize. He didn't understand. I've been telling stories for years. I can't remember one. But the host was so gracious and royal. He said, don't worry. You're probably exhausted from your, your journey. So just have a nice rest and we'll pick it up tomorrow. Well, long story short, the next two meals, it went exactly the same way. He hadn't a clue. And he was completely freaked out. And so at the end of the Shabbos, he didn't know what happened. And the, and the nobleman said, listen, here's a couple of hundred lira for your trouble to come here. God bless you. Go on your way. And out he went, but he was a shaken man. He had no idea what had just happened. After all these travels, telling the stories of the Baal Shem Tov, I can't remember a single one. As he was shaking his head in disbelief, walking down the road, he passed by a house, and the windows and the shutters of the house were all closed. And all of a sudden, he remembered a snippet of a story, and he wrote it down so he wouldn't he wouldn't forget. And he ran back to the nobleman's house and he burst into the library and said, I remember, I remember, I remember. And there was the nobleman <laughs> crying, his eyes swollen with tears. He says, okay, sit down. She says, did someone die? He says, no, it's okay, sit down, tell me, tell me. So he says, listen, I don't remember the beginning of the story. I don't remember the end of the story. But once I was with the Baal Shem Tov and we were riding in a coach and he said, wait, there's going to be a pogrom. There's going to be a, a, a genocidal killing of the Jews in this capital city of another town. We have to get to it and stop it. He says, I said, we'll never get there in town. That's hundreds of miles away. He says, don't worry, just get in the coach. We got in the coach, and with some kind of wonder-working material, in a thrice, we were right there in the city. We get out of the coach, and we walk into this house that's right next to the square, and we see there's tons of people walking into the square, getting ready for something. We didn't know what it was. And the Baal Shem Tov knocks on the door. And they open and say, who's there? He says, the Baal Shem Tov, let me. He says, what are you trying to kill us? He says, I didn't come here to get anybody hurt. Let me in. So he opens up the door, he walks in, and he opens up the shutters to the door and looks out over the center of the, of the square. And all of a sudden, a bishop walks up to the center and gets on the podium and starts to rouse the crowd to get him ready for the killing and the looting. The Baal Shem Tov turns to me and says, listen, walk out there and tell the bishop I want to see him. He says, what? They'll kill me if they see I walk in. He says, they're not going to kill you. Walk out there. What can I do? I did. I walked out there. And the crowd parted like the Red Sea. And I walked up to the bishop and I looked at him and I said, the Baal Shem Tov wants to see you. His face turned pale, ashen. He said, well, tell him I'll be there in five minutes. I walked back to the Baal Shem. He says, he says, he'll come here in five minutes. He says, hey, go back out there and tell him I want to see him right now. They'll kill me. Go out there. What could I do? I walked out there. And you know what? The crowd just parted. I walked right up to the bishop and I said, the Baal Shem says right now. He put the crowd on hold. And he followed me into the house with the Baal Shem. They went into a back room. They closed the door. And for two hours, we had no idea what was happening. Two hours later, the door opened up. And the bishop walked out. He looked like a completely different man. His face was red. His eyes were swollen. Tears were streaming down his face. He walked back out to the podium. He dismissed the crowd. And they all went home. And that's, that's all I remember of the story. The nobleman looks at me and he says, don't you recognize who I am? I've been a lot of places. I've seen a lot of faces. I'm the bishop. The bishop? 
you're not. You're an Italian Jewish noble. He says, no. I was born Jewish. But my family was so poor. We suffered so much that they gave me to the church, hoping that I would somehow have a better life. And so I was raised in that tradition. And all along the way, to prove my allegiance, my loyalty, my fealty to the church, I made more and more concessions. And then I rose in the ranks to eventually, I became a bishop. And I was even going to prove how loyal I was by leading a pogrom against the Jewish people. And somehow the Baal Shem Tov found out about it. And he made me do teshuva, repentance. And I asked him, well, how will I know after all the deeds I've done if my repentance has been accepted? He said, one day somebody will come to you who knows exactly the story and will tell it to you exactly as it happened. And when you hear that, then you'll know that your repentance has been accepted. And so that's why I put out the word to find any stories I could about the Baal Shem Tov. And then you realize there's only two people in the world who know what happened, the Baal Shem Tov and you. And so when you came, I was so overjoyed because I said, maybe this is it. Maybe I'll hear the story. And then the first night, when you didn't have anything to say, my heart dropped and I realized my repentance hadn't gone far enough. And then the second and the third night happened and then I realized I'm not good enough. And then when you left, I was so down. I got down on the knees of my heart, gewalt, oh, gewalt, did I pray. And then when you came back and you told the story, then I realized that my prayers had pierced the ears of heaven and finally my repentance was accepted. So my friends, you never know what story you have to tell, even if it's just a snippet about your own life that might save another person. So never forget, keep telling stories.